Now, good morning and welcome to Daisha Today. Welcome to the show. And if you want to text us or ring in, our text and WhatsApp number, you should know it by now. It's 83 975 text or WhatsApp. Kieran has just texted in. Damien, can I clarify, please, that all staff employed in the laundry department are directly employed by the HSE? That's in from Kieran. If you want to phone in, 051 846 123. We're going to be talking to our head of news, Liz Reddy, in a minute about the coronavirus and what it means for people in Waterford and also in terms of the national picture. I'm also going to be talking to Mary Butler. Uh, She is on the front page of the Munster Express this week, claiming that she has been victimised in relation to the Bill Keneally story. Michael Walsh, CEO of Waterford Council, is due to come on the programme as well to talk to us about the very latest regarding the North Keys. And Mary Roach, the newly uh, reinstalled councillor in the council, is going to come back. She is is going to be in studio, hopefully after 11 o'clock. She was co-opted back onto the council. She originally had left and Matt Shanahan had taken her seat and Matt Shanahan then got elected, as we all know, into the um, into the position of TD. So Mary is back on, so we'll be talking to her. We also want to know about Lent. Have you done anything for Lent? Are you giving up anything for Lent? Uh, is Lent still something that's important to you? Uh, if you're of another religion, what do you think about the idea of fasting or giving up things? What's is it a good idea? And Ash Wednesday, have you been to Mass this morning? What about the ashes? Liz, are you giving up anything for Lent? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Either am I at the minute. You know, if, if, if you give up something, you just want it. So uh, <laughs> I just decide not, not to know it. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be... Um, uh, religious, so um, yeah, that not. yeah. Okay, listen, thanks for joining us. Liz Reddy, news editor. We're talking about the coronavirus and we're talking about the story that broke yesterday uh, that at least three schools, we now understand it's it's only two, where there was some concerns, let's just put it like that, and there were De La Salle School and St. Paul's School. So what do we know under, What do we know at this stage about the story, Liz? Yeah, as you said, it broke yesterday um, by Daniel McConnell from the Irish Examiner. So students from two Waterford schools, uh, St. Paul's and De La Salle, they uh, just returned from skiing trips in Italy. This is a, a class or two of transition year students, we exactly, understand. Yeah? Exactly, on their, on their midterm. And um, so uh, the both schools issued um, uh, let, or not letters, but the e- emails to the parents. And St. Paul's, for instance, says 40 students and four teachers were skiing in Italy last week. We've met the students and teachers and all are healthy and not presenting with any symptoms of the coronavirus. We've contacted the HSE and have been told that we were skiing in an area of zero to low risk. We are following the instructions of the HSE and will keep you updated if there are any further developments. That was from the principal. The same happened then in in De La Salle and they were in the same position um, and uh, you spoke I think to a mother of a De La Salle student and she'd spoken to the HSE and the area that they were in was also deemed low risk. Uh, we spoke last night to Jason Murphy, Councillor Jason Murphy. His son was actually on one of those trips. He was on the St Paul's trip. And this is what Jason had to say. I rang the principal in the school, I suppose like any worried parent would, and uh, she had assured me that the bus passed through the area, but they weren't off the bus when they came through the affected area. The actual place where they were skiing, they have been advised by the HSE, was in a low to zero uh, risk area. So I suppose as a parent, I'm happy enough with that. Uh, I'd advise all other parents listening, I suppose, to monitor their kids, but not to be overly worried. Like I said, it's low to zero risk. Low to zero risk. Um, so th- we did hear that there was a third Washford school and we heard that that might have been Art School Namara in Tremor. We contacted them this morning and they said, no, they were actually in Andorra skiing. Yeah, because there is some confusion. And Daniel McConnell, I spoke to him as well with the Irish Examiner. Um, they were in Andorra and Andorra is down on the Spanish-French border. Um, a small principality, a country in its own right, whereas the area in northern Italy that is one of the c- contagious areas, you want to call it that, is Andola. So there might have been confusion, Some confusion regarding there. that. Yeah. So nothing, nothing to worry about regarding our yeah, school and Tremor. You know, you have Austria, Croatia and Switzerland. They've now reported their first cases of the virus, um, you know, with Italy trying their best to contain it, but it seems to be spreading throughout Italy. Um, 
there are uh, um, I do, that hotel in Tenerife that's been on lockdown. There's four Irish people in that hotel. Your heart would have to go out to them, like, you know, to be on holiday and, you know, to be stuck in your room, like... Yeah, it's there's just... only what, the, the feeling is and listening to the news this morning is that it's only a matter of time before it comes to Ireland. Now, it might still be possible to stop. It. And one of the things they've decided to do is obviously they're talking to the IRFU this morning as we speak regarding the cancellation of the match. And here is Tony Holohan talking about the match cancellation. Tony Holohan from the expert group that has been set up to. Uh, He's the chief medical officer at the Department of Health. Yeah. That event is the 7th of March, which is less than. 14 days away and 14 days is the incubation period for for this infection. So there have been a lot of cases in that region of Italy and we expect that number to increase over the coming days and I think it would be nothing other than irresponsible if we were to recommend otherwise. So we think this is the only responsible public health advice that we could give. The IRFU seemed to be on the back foot last night because the statement, so the Department of uh, um, of health got on to obviously Simon Harris. He issued a statement straight away and obviously didn't talk to the IRFU. So um, they were then saying, well, you know, what's the reason for this? And they've um, asked for an urgent meeting with Simon Harris and that's happening at 11 o'clock this morning. But it, it it looks likely that game won't go ahead now yeah. at this stage. At this stage and depending what happens the next week or so, it from a normal person's point of view, it would be right to call it off. Because you could imagine, now I know a lot of the Italians are going to come over anyway and they might be in Temple Bar, now they might be screened, but if you have 40, 50,000 people together in an area, um, if if there is one person there with the virus, you're fecked. Exactly. And, it, you know, if you go back to the situation in Tenerife, it was an Italian doctor um, that was in that hotel in Tenerife and that's um, where the problem arose. So if you have a lot of people coming over from Italy, it's ju- it just goes without saying. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle now, isn't it? You know, and you can see it, this virus popping up in the US now. They're saying it's not if, it's, it's when. Um, and again, in terms of the uh, idea of it spreading and how it spreads, that's something people should should keep an eye on and, and, and read up on as well. Um, two very simple things we'll talk about briefly, Liz. One is the idea of would the government have the, the power to actually close down a town or a city? So let's say, for example, it did break out here in Waterford. What would happen next? We don't really know. The first thing is if somebody goes to a doctor COVID-19 is now what's called a notifiable disease under regulations of the Minister for Health. So a doctor has the power to de- detain a probable case to comply with infection prevention. So if you did go to your GP and you may have COVID-19, the doctor could say, right, you'll have to detain you here. Literally call the, not the guards, you potentially call the guards, but call the health experts. You have to go into a quarantine unit. Then there's the idea of the um, how that, that well has, prepared we are. That has happened in Waterford, hasn't it? We we don't know the details, but there was somebody, as far as we know, um, did present at, at a doctor's and, you know, they, they were checked home, out. Uh, uh, they were checked out and they went home and they self-quarantined. So that means literally locking yourself into your house in an area where you're not mixing with others, keeping an eye for two weeks because the period of incubation is two weeks. That's the important thing. So any parent listening to this, again, just keep an eye, as we've heard, on the children. But the likelihood is that none of the schools in Waterford, there's not going to be any infection from them. Um, But again, it's this unknowing. And when people are reading it on the news and seeing it on the telly and hearing all about this. And it is terrifying, you know, when you see everybody with the masks. And, you know, the the, the fact is that you, you, it, it might not present itself until five or six days later as well. So I'd say, you know, that doctor from Italy who went on his holidays to Tenerife, obviously, being a doctor, maybe should have known a bit better, but, you know, obviously felt well. And then when he got there, um, became ill. Val from Norwood has texted in to say, I sincerely hope the schools that came back from skiing had hand-sized sanitizers. Everyone that entered schools should be made use it as imperative. And anyone that says that flu kills as well, I'll just say the flu has been well researched globally. So you can't compare flu with COVID-19. Uh, and I know a lot of hand sanitizers have been sold out. Yeah. And, you know, because it's really important to wash hands and use the, the hand sanitizers because it's it's viral, it's airborne. And, you know, that's how it's, it's so contagious, you know, so if somebody's touching anything. Um, I don't know whether you saw on um, 
the Deputy Minister, Health Minister from, from Iran, Iran yeah. who has the coronavirus and was having these interviews on TV, uh, you know, looking physically unwell and then um, having um, uh, meetings with journalists and other ministers, you know, so... Like it's it's spreading there as well now. Yeah, uh, Texter, what's the situation in Krakow in Poland? Uh, the COVID nineteen we're due to head there next week. As far as I know, there's been no outbreak there, but it's certainly worth checking with your travel advisors about that. If it comes to quarantine, how will they quarantine Irish people? It's going to be very very difficult. How are we going to do it again? This will be something different from the foot and mouth. It'll be something different from the SARS. Uh, so we just don't know. But I mean, what do they do in China? Everybody just had to stay indoors. Mm. You know, Could and you imagine it, doing that here. <laughs> what would we really have to stay here for the duration. <laughs> we'll have to set up little studios in our houses. <laughs> Liz Reddy, thanks very much for thanks, joining Damien. us. Thank you. Uh, stay with us, Mary Butler next. Now, welcome back to the programme. Some texts and comments coming in. Um, I think that the schools should have quarantined those students. But as we say, there's a very, very low risk and there was no risk in terms of uh, uh, indicating that they should be quarantined. So... The schools and the authorities make decisions on the basis, obviously, of the facts that are available. And uh, that's what has been done. Uh, keep your texts and comments coming in. Uh, 083 975 uh, Mary Butler, Fianna Fáil TD for Waterford. Good morning. Good morning, Damien. Thank you very much for coming in to yeah, us. And thanks for inviting me. Not at all. I appreciate you coming in. Um, Mary, I'm just going to go through a little bit of a timeline. So people just bear with me for a second. It's important just to, to understand why we're, why we're covering this story this morning. So accountant, former basketball coach and former Fianna Fáil tallyman Bill Keneally, he sexually abused boys in Waterford in the 1980s. He's currently serving a 14 year prison sentence. He was sentenced in February 2016, four years ago. In relation to 10 sample counts of indecent assault against minors, he pleaded guilty. In 2018, the Court of Criminal Appeal upheld the prison sentence imposed on Keneally. He formerly had an address at Somerville Avenue, Watford City. Brendan Keneally is a cousin of Bill Keneally, is a former Fianna Fáil minister, who has said he was told his cousin was a sex abuser in 2002, but he didn't report the matter to the Gardaí. So in September 2016, I wrote an article for the Sunday Independent reporting that the mother of one victim had said that former TD Brendan Keneally was told in 2002 that her son had been abused. And I quote from the article. He said to leave it with him and he would get the Monsignor to deal with it, said the mother of this victim. The former TD told me that contrary to what people might think, he wasn't aware that his cousin was an abuser in the 70s, 80s or 90s. That's very important to say. And I quote him. The first time I became aware of it was early 2002 when someone very close to a victim told me. I was shocked and blown away by it and nearly fell off the chair. I made sure certain things were done. I got him assessed medically, which found he wasn't still offending. So when asked, I asked them, did he talk to the Gardaí about it? Brenda Keneally said he didn't. As the victim said, he or she didn't want to go further with it. And regarding the Monsignor, he said, yes, I spoke with him about it. The Monsignor in question is Monsignor Shine, who has since died. He's related to the family. And he said, he told me he didn't know in the past about his nephew, Bill Keneally, being an abuser. So victims say there's many questions left unanswered and investigations by the state are continuing. So in the general election of 2016, Brendan Keneally played an important part in Mary Butler's election campaign, in which you topped the poll. I've been told by Fianna Fáil locally that during the local elections last year, Brendan Keneally did not canvass for you or for Fianna Fáil. In the general election last month, Brendan Keneally did canvass and in fact may well have canvassed on the same night that you were canvassing in a certain part of the city. I'll ask you about that. So I suppose the first question is Mary Butler and we'll deal with the canvassing issue first. Okay. The canvassing issue first and then we'll deal with the online matters. Why was Brendan Keneally canvassing with you or on your behalf last month? Because, as we all know, there was a general election. It was a three and a half week campaign. I had about 50 um, people canvassing for me throughout the city and county. And Brendan Keneally was one of those. Why was Brendan Keneally not canvassing in the local elections last year? I can't answer that. 
I can't. I don't know why he wasn't. I canvassed with most of the councillors at the time throughout the city and county, and um, I, I, I don't know the reason for that. That's an honest answer. Were you, or did you, did Fianna Fáil make a decision not to have Brendan Keneally canvassing as part of the local election campaign team last year? Not that I'm aware of. Did you know and encourage Brendan Keneally to canvass as part of the canvassing team in the last six weeks? Um, I was aware that Brendan Keneally was canvassing and I was actually out canvassing with Brendan on a couple of occasions. So you were out canvassing with him? Yes, I was. Yes. No, I'm say, being honest, yeah. I was. And as we say, Brendan has said exactly what he said and he hasn't disputed anything that I've reported on in the past, either when I was with RTE or with doing the reports for the Sunday Independent. And I've asked Brendan to see if he'd come on to, mm. to talk about it. So Brendan has said he's done nothing wrong. He didn't know anything about in the 70s, the 80s or 90s. He did know in 2002 when somebody came and the person said, I don't want to go any further with this. He said he spoke to Monsignor Shine. Um, you did say in an interview with old Dalton for the Irish Times that you were not aware of calls to drop Brendan Keneally from your canvassing team. Do you recall an interview that you did with Eamon Keane, my predecessor, in 2016 in this studio trying to defend the actions of having Brendan as part of your election campaign when a number of the Keneally victims had criticised that? Do I remember the interview with Eamon Keane in 2016? Vaguely, vaguely. The reason I ask that is that you are saying that you weren't aware, you spoke to Owen Dalton, mm. quoted in the Irish Times, that you were not aware of the calls to drop Brendan Keneally from your canvassing team. And yet, our understanding is that in 2016, you would have been aware that there were calls from the victims of okay. Bill Keneally. OK, I, I, as we're talking about timelines, I think it's very important that we put timelines in place. On one occasion and one occasion only, one victim of Bill Keneally asked to meet me. I think it was in 2017, 2018, but I'm open to correction. And that was Colin Power. And I met with him and Councillor Jason Murphy attended also. I told you this previously. Um, we met for about two and a half hours. It was a private conversation. He requested it was private. I never discussed it afterwards. The next interaction I had with any of the victims were during the time that the Commission of Inquiry was being put in place in Leinster House and I sat with Jim O'Callaghan who's our spokesperson for justice and I spoke out clearly in favour of um, a Commission of Inquiry being put in place. The victims had previously met with Micheál Martin and with Jim O'Callaghan. Um, I wasn't at that particular meeting and I spoke out clearly and concisely on that day in support. When the the talking in the doll was over, I went upstairs and I shook hands with whichever victims were present in the gallery and I wished them well and said that if I could do anything to help, I would. I think it's fair to, to point out that in June 2019, um, Bill Keneally claimed that I defamed him in the doll when I spoke in support of the Commission of Inquiry. He took issue with me saying... Um, and the, the, what he took issue with me saying was that I, um, when I said I, he was allowed to abuse children for such a protracted period of time, um, he then put a legal team in place. They looked for an investigation. They wanted to uh, impose penalties on me in the doll and they wanted um, the doll record to be challenged. So I think it's fair to put that out there as well, that he has an issue with me also. I don't doubt your bona fides regarding... Uh, wanting matters investigated and wanting and, and, and calling mm. out Bill mm. Keneally. OK, so let's be quite clear on this. There is no association between Bill Keneally and Brendan Keneally. OK, apart from the fact that they're related and Brendan Keneally is still an active member in Fianna Fáil. Yes. And because of that timeline I read out mm. about 2002, and we're not talking about 1970s mm. or 80s, we're talking about 2002, mm. where... If somebody reported sexual abuse matters, is it incumbent on you? And Brendan Keneally would say he didn't break any law with that. So, for example, in this week's Monster Express article, and the headline screams, I've been victimised over Keneally. I didn't write the headline, just to be clear. Correct, you didn't. I did not write no, the headline. Didn't. But the first line is, and you do say that you've been victimised. Yes, and we'll talk but about I, that. But I did not write the headline, and I think you have to be fair to me there. I'm being 100% pa- paper fair. Paper never refuses ink. It says that you were in school when the atrocities took place. I was. 
and but you're not being associated with Bill Keneally. Like I said, you're being associated with Brendan Keneally as somebody who's canvassing on your team. And the victims have said that they don't think that's right. OK, and, and that's a fair point. That's a fair point. But why has it been done, Mary Butler TD? If that's a fair point, you knew about their... <sighs> It was a complete error of judgment on my behalf for this election. I suppose in 2016, I didn't realise the enormity of um, the whole case. Um, The election was just over in February 2016 when Bill Keneally was jailed. Um, I I think it was in around the February of that year. I'm not exactly sure of the timelines. Um, It was a huge error of judgment on my behalf to have Brendan Keneally canvass for me in 2020. I have never met um, the other victims on a formal setting and any of the issues they have with me or with my um, association with Brendan Keneally has only ever come to me third hand. It has never been articulated to me, you know, like we're sitting here now across. Have you spoken to Brendan Keneally about this matter? I spoke to Brendan Keneally last Monday, 10 days ago. And I would like to apologise unreservedly, unreservedly, firstly, to Linda and Barry Murphy for the hurt and upset it caused Linda and Barry when Brendan Keneally canvassed um, their house on the Thursday before the election. The election was on the 8th, so that was the 6th. That's the first thing I would like to categorically apologise. Barry was a a victim, as we know, one of the victims that was named in court. And and I would like to apologise unreservedly to... Barry and Linda. I would also like to apologise unreservedly to the other victims, um, Colin Power, Jason Clancy and others. I don't know all their names. Um, As I said, I've only met one of them in a formal capacity. I never would have imagined, I'm not a vindictive person, it's not in me. And I suppose it was a complete and utter error on my part that I didn't foresee the damage that could have been done or the hurt and anxiety that was caused to these men. I know they have been to hell and back. And just to prove... And, we'll talk, we'll, and I want to show how genuine I am we'll talk with this office, apology. We'll, we'll talk about the office in a minute, OK? Because okay. I just want to tease this out very briefly. Mm. So I know we can't go on too long about okay. this. But again, you cannot tell me as the main Fianna Fáil person in Waterford, effectively, the main elected representative, why Brendan Keneally wasn't canvassing last year in the local elections, last May and uh, April, and yet he was canvassing in the general election. Was it a case that you just, he just kind of, it happened? Like, I think, to be fair, it, it did happen. Brendan, Brendan would have a lot of experience of canvassing in the city for many, many years. Um, you know, he used his experience to help you get re-elected in the general election last month. It was never deliberate. It was never, it it wasn't analysed to that extent. But hold on a second, Deputy Butler. You are a clever person Mm. and you knew that Brendan Keneally knows areas very well. Mm. But you also knew in the past because Colin Power had said it to you And we'll talk about the office in a minute and Mm. that association Mm. between Mm. Brendan and the Keneally Mm. family. And yet, you canvassed with Brendan Keneally at least twice and he was part of the team and part of the canvassing team. So he was fully integrated Mm. in the Fianna Fáil general election machine in the last two months. He was and I suppose the only person... And the only reason that you are now talking about this and the only reason this has become an issue... Is because, is because you got caught out. It's because Brendan Keneally, by mistake, called to the house of one of the victims. Like, I've been getting texts from the victims mm. and the upset. Yes. They're so upset about this. And as we say, there's no connection between Brendan and Bill. Brenda did nothing wrong. But there is no connection between me, no, and, me and Bill either. I think that needs to be stated quite been, clearly. That has been said. But it hasn't on social media. OK, we'll talk about social media in a second. But in terms of the perception, you know perception is very important I do, in politics. I do, I do. And you have apologised mm, yes. unreservedly. Yes. And you were saying it's a huge error of judgement. Yes. I'm asking you, are you only saying that now? No, absolutely because, not. Because well, no. if, if, if it didn't become public that Brendan Keneally was canvassing with Fianna Fáil, you wouldn't have come out and said, oh, by the way, I've made an error of judgment. Well, 
To be honest, I, I, I think that's a little bit disingenuous. I'm not a vindictive person. It's disingenuous about it. I think it's disingenuous that you can assume that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, all I can do is apologise unreservedly for the hurt and upset caused. I understand, but I, I, take, am, I, I take issue with you saying I'm being disingenuous with that, Deputy Butler, because I'm asking you a very simple question. And you're saying that that's not the point. You're saying, no, he canvassed. And it's an error of judgment now because... It was. A, it's an error of judgment now, and it was an error of judgment during the campaign. But it wasn't because you went canvassing with them. There was no error of judgment when you were out on the nights knocking on doors. To be honest, to be honest, did you feel any error of judgment during the campaign? No. To be honest, I I, I don't think I realised the enormity of the hurt it was causing to the victims. I can't be fairer than that. I don't, I don't, like you said here on, on radio. Why haven't, you, why haven't you met them? For example, gonna, like you wanted to come on this yes. morning. I'm delighted you've come yes. on and thank yes. you very much. I yes. appreciate it because yes. it's difficult to do and you could have said no. But like, you didn't, the victims have been on and they have a statement that they've issued. That the, the victims. They haven't, they haven't met you and they want to meet you and she say, you want to apologise to your victims and yet, you haven't heard they haven't heard from you directly recently regarding this matter. Um, like, would you come on air with them? Damien, on one occasion only, one of the victims looked to meet me. I met him within a week. Hmm. On a second occasion, um, that same person came to my office in Dungarvan with a journalist and came into my office and there was a few words um, expressed. On no other ca- occasion, no other occasion, did the victims ever formally ask to meet me? I am. There was a back channel opened last week regarding a, a request for some of the victims to meet you and to go on air or to meet you privately. Yeah. And, they and I have absolutely no problem. Um, I have absolutely no problem with meeting the victims. Absolutely no problem what, what whatsoever. Do you mean, pr- privately? Privately, yes. Only and, privately. If, and if you'd like to attend, you're more than welcome. But would you come, like, for example, you don't want to debate this publicly with them? Well, I, I, I prefer to meet them privately first. Okay. I'll be honest with you, because at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I think the whole focus is after shifting. The whole focus should be on justice for the victims. It should be on the commission of inquiry that I fully support. But the whole focus has now shifted to Mary Butler, who is a TD um, approximately 30 years after those lads were abused. Who has just admitted you've made an error of judgment. Yes, I did. A serious yes. error of judgment by yes. having Brenda Keneally yes. on your canvassing team. Yes, and I, and I, and I will keep apologising for that. And I would just like in terms to say, of the office, for example, okay. I would like to Colin say Colin Power spoke to you and criticised you for renting a Fianna Fáil office from Brendan Keneally. It, it, do, he, you, do you still rent an office from Brendan Keneally? When Colin Power spoke to me over two and a half years ago, it was a private conversation and the office was not raised. OK, I want to be fair on that. And I checked that out last night. Um, it, 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 we decided not to take notes at that meeting, to be fair to everyone. I normally take notes at meetings um, to show how genuine my apology is. I am leaving the office. I served notice on the office last Monday week, so it was 10 days ago. So that's, people were saying, why haven't I come on? I was dealing with a lot of issues last week. Um, I met Brendan Keneally and I served notice on the office. I will be leaving the office within the next fortnight approximately. Where it takes office? a little It's on for the waterside opposite the Gasworks car park. I've been in there with over four years. I was in there probably three years, three months, sorry, three months before the general election um, of February of 2016 and I, I continue to stay there um, for the last four years. And that's down uh, beside where Jason Clancy, another victim, has one of his offices. An office on the waterside. Um, I, I've been in that office for the last four years and... Why are you getting out now? Because I now... Is this controversy? No, not because of the controversy, because I think... I never assumed, I never assumed or I never would have imagined that my office location in the centre of Waterford would cause so much upset to the victims. I just, I didn't read it right. I'll be honest with you, I didn't get it. I get it now. I didn't read it right. I felt maybe two years ago when the issue came up about the office, um, I, I just kind of felt at the time that, you know, I was renting an office, I was paying rent. I, I suppose I didn't realise the enormity of me renting an office from Brendan Keneally. And just to be fair, Damien, and you have said this on your programme in the last two weeks, that, Derm- that Brendan Keneally has not been accused of anything. Correct. And I've said that consistently. Yeah. And 
I suppose because that had been said to me for so many times that Brendan Keneally has not been accused of anything, um, I suppose I continue to stay in the office. Uh, it's convenient. It's a great location. It's great for parking. It's a convenient office. So I'm now charged with trying to source another office in Waterford, but I will be gone out of that office in the next 10 to 14 days. Because it comes down again to perception. As we say, Brendan Keneally did nothing wrong. If one of your family members had been sexually abused, Deputy Butler, and a public representative was told, but didn't contact Gardaí about it, would that person be welcome in your home? Well, I suppose, you know, we're we're looking at 2002 and it's kind of a moral and and an ethical issue at that stage. If I had been informed in 2002, I believe I would have informed the guards, but I can't answer for anybody else. And I've said this to you previously, the type of person I am, I would have in, involved the guards. And I know, I do believe that um, the, the, the victims took offence to the last line of my personal statement when I said my commitment to and support for victims of sexual abuse has been complete and unwavering. And Criticism of my statement in that respect is not open to challenge because that was a general statement. Unfortunately, since becoming a TD, I have worked with more than one case of abuse. I've actually worked with three that are private and confidential. And I, I have to stand over that. And my, my, I have worked with other victims of sex, sexual abuse. I've worked with people for elder abuse. And that's where that statement came from. Um, I know um, the victims were not happy with that statement because I saw it in the media, but that referred to my work in general with all victims. The the, the victims have issued a, a statement, a three paragraph statement. It's it's quite extensive, but it and they, I haven't seen it. They want to categorically say that the victims wish to categorically state they never engaged in bullying of any description against you. I know you're not saying that. Um, everything we stated is absolute fact, and they're she is not a victim of bullying from us, says the statement. We've also conducted ourselves with great dignity. We know our moral compass is of the highest standard. And she says, the statement says, Mary Butler has not been victimised or associated with Bill Keneally. She continues by the association with Brendan and that's the issues that they have. And we have, we, we have broken that. Yes, and I have never ever accused these lads of bullying me on Facebook and I don't believe that they have anything to do with it. I believe there's a political agenda going on in relation to the bullying on Facebook. They accuse you of of missing the point regarding this and you've admitted that, that you've you've missed the point. And yet people are, are, are texting in you're now saying that you're going to do things differently. Yes. Um, Damien, all I can do is keep apologising for any hurt or upset that I have by being associated with Brendan Keneally canvassing, by renting an office from Brendan Keneally. I can only apologise unreservedly to them. I can do no more. I have no association with Bill Keneally. I never met him in my life. I don't know what the man looks like apart from pictures that appear in the press. I was in school. I think I'm approximately the same age as the lads. I was in school when those lads were being abused. I'm a public representative now representing the people of Waterford City and County. And 30 years on, approximate time frame, I'm guilty by association because um, I rent an office from Brendan Keneally and Brendan Keneally canvassed for me. There is no one else to blame within Fianna Fáil for this, only me. Yeah. I, I chose to have Brendan Keneally canvassing for me. It was a mistake. I, know. I chose to rent the office from Brendan Keneally. I now see it was a mistake. All I can do is keep apologising. I never meant to cause offence. Again, and just in, uh, in researching this interview, like Saoirse McGarrigal from The Mirror, I think, was one of the, the person that met you or spoke to you at the same time as Colin Mm. regarding that. And the quote from her in September 2017, I am renting an apartment from Brendan. I think it might have been an office. An office. Which has nothing to do with the crimes. I don't see see how there can be a conflict of interest. That's the quote that I have from that. Yes, but I I just think to put that into perspective, uh, that particular day... um, I was blindsided in my office when somebody um, walked in, put a microphone in front of me. And to be honest, that paper has never printed anything since. And I just prefer to leave it at that. In terms of that issue on 2017, you didn't see a conflict of interest at the time, but now you do. 
I see the conflict of interest now because of the hurt and upset it's causing the lads. They are obviously devastated. They feel I am not supporting them. And as a result, I'm apologising unreservedly and I am leaving the office. And I hope that small action in some small yeah. way might re- might reach across the divide and show them that I am genuine. I'm not a vindictive person. It's not in my nature. I would never... I would never intentionally hurt or upset. They've gone through enough. But I think the focus needs to shift back now to the Commission of Inquiry and, and to justice for the victims because the, the focus is now on Mary Butler. And I want to get back to work and represent the, the people focus, of Waterford City yeah, and one County. Fi- one final question on the canvassing. Like when you were walking around with Brendan Keneally, there's victims like around Waterford City and, and further afield. Mm. Did you not think... God, if we come across one of these victims now, yeah. or a relation, and you met Linda, and Brendan met Linda, mm. like, did you not think? I obviously didn't. I obviously didn't. The whole frenzy of an ele- the whole frenzy of an election, three and a half weeks. That particular Thursday, I was in Dunmore Passage and Crook with one team. There was a team out in Dungarvan. There was a team out in Waterford. The whole purpose was to get re-elected, maximise the vote. Listen, I was completely blindsided. I can't say it often enough. I was wrong. I am sorry. What is the situation with the Facebook post? Did you report to the Gardaí oh, regarding the Facebook post? Yeah. Are they investigating that? Absolutely. This is about the emoji? Yes. Do you believe that your account was hacked? I believe there was a fake page set up in my name that liked and laughed and shared a post by Jason Clancy, which is irrelevant who put up the post, but liked and laughed and shared a post. Is there any chance that anybody in your team or somebody Absolutely else might not. have just hit the button by mistake? Ab- a- Absolutely not. The, and and the, all, those, the in- all those people that have said mm. what you're alleging mm. is wrong, you mm. dispute that? I dispute that 100%. And I would just like to say it's a live case in the hands of the Gardaí who have been extremely supportive. They have been helpful. They have been second to none. And it is now at a national level with the Gardaí and I believe the truth will out. Today is Ash Wednesday and I'm a religious person and I think the truth will out. But why I had to go to the guards on the Wednesday was because it crossed the line as far as I was concerned. Because when these um, trolls on Facebook, when they were finished um, on my page, when my page was removed, suspended, they started on my daughter's page. And for me, that crossed the line. And finally, I know I'm going to play... 50 seconds of a clip from Colin Power. It's important the victims are heard. Absolutely. And I know you didn't want to come on with them this morning head to head, but it's important that they are heard. And I have one last question for you after this. This is Colin Power speaking to me last week. I'll tell you what the inaccuracies of that statement are. The first one I would be very annoyed with is, you know, there is a perception from that statement that we are involved in that harassment campaign. We're categorically, we are not, never will be. I've said that already. Mary Butler um, has said... You know, again, there, and I've dealt with this, she's been criticised for having a relation of the perpetrator. It's not about the relation. It's about the whoever he was, we would have an issue with this. You know, she has said that um, she has given unwavering and complete support to us. That is inaccurate in our view from our dealings with not only Mary Butler, but with Fianna Fáil in general. They have given us no help. They they would say to you, oh, we wrote a letter, we met the victims. That was years ago. They've done damn all since that, and they'll hide behind all these things and reasons and their PR. But, you know, the fact of the matter is they haven't been helping. Um, Unwavering support, and yet you've admitted... That you made a gross error of judgment. So yes, but I think it wasn't done. Unra- I, I know you talk about your statements in the doll and all that. Yes, but yes. Would you like to correct that statement? No. What, what, I, what I would like to say: the last line of my personal statement, and we've addressed this already. My commitment to and support for four victims of sexual abuse. It didn't state four victims of sexual abuse has been complete and unwavering. I've dealt with three other cases that I will never discuss. Uh, OK, that's the first thing. The second thing I would like to say is I have never ever have linked the victims of Bill Keneally, the paedophile, who is in jail, and I hope they throw away the key. I'll be honest with you. I have never linked them to the abuse on social media, and I never will, and I don't think they... I I categorically say, but there is a real and sustained attempt to try and link me to a very dark chapter in Waterford's history when these numerous boys were abused. I believe 
some political opponents have been very active online sharing it. This wasn't only shared locally in Waterford City and County. This has been shared nationally to try and maximum the most political damage to me. That's, there's two different issues at play here. The first issue is the canvassing the, issue. The second the, is the social the office media and the Bill Keneally victims. Yeah. Um, and the second issue is and there is a concentrated attempt at the moment to undermine me at every turn. By what political party? I let the people decide that. I will let I will let Sinn the people Fein? decide that. Well, it's obviously there was a Sinn Féin councillor called me out yesterday in 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 relation to but this. There's no insinuation whatsoever that absolutely Declan no Clint was ins- involved in any way. Absolutely whatsoever. no. He issued a press statement. Absolutely no insinuation yeah. whatsoever that the victims of Bill Keneally have anything to do with no, but online no abuse. No insinuation that Declan Clune is involved in the online. Well, uh, there was either. well, no there, insinuation well, there, whatsoever. well, there was a lot of online sharing by certain um, political, political opponents. Parties, political but no, parties. Uh, political opponents. There was a lot of online sharing. Anybody can see it. It's, yeah. You can just well, I can't because but my again, my pages has been suspended. But I just want because of the vacuum of that suspension, yes. that was the problem that you had, and yes. I understand yes. that. Yes, and, uh, and 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 the chances of me ever going back on Facebook, I, I believe, are very slim. Will Brendan Keneally be canvassing for you again? No, absolutely not. Mary Butler, thank you very much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. Now I'm going to talk to Michael Walsh in a second. A lot of texts coming through about the Mary Butler interview. I'll get to them as we can. Uh, we ran over on a number of different things, probably after 11 o'clock before I get to some of them. Uh, they're around 50-50, people saying, um, well done, Mary. And others criticising Mary quite categorically. Um, and other people talking about the, the nature of the interview. First, I have to go to Michael Walsh because you're waiting for us. Michael, good morning. Morning, Damien. Thanks very much for joining us, Michael. I know we ha- don't have too much time, but I'm delighted you're talking to us. The final decision on Waterford North Quay's city centre expansion is expected this spring. A press release, a media release that you issued yesterday. Can you give us the latest, please, about where are we on the North Quays? Um, where well, we are, I suppose there's two different elements to it, Damien. One is... Um the funding in terms of the access, different access projects that are involved, uh, which aren't just related to the North Keys, that to do with opening up access to the north side of the city, are uh, that has obviously been delayed in the context of uh, the uh, elections and government, and it probably requires a government decision. We'd be expecting that imminently once we get a new government. Um, We got very positive news, obviously, in the last week or two that the NTA are uh, contributing significantly to that and indeed are covering this year's, will cover this year's costs in terms of it. Uh, We've always been, the NTA have always approved strategically of what we're trying to do there, but this is a a confirmation that they're prepared to contribute on the financial side of things. That obviously takes pressure off the URDF funding, which was our application to the Urban Regeneration and Development Fund, uh, and in a sense makes it a lot easier to to finalise this. So we're certainly hopeful that that will happen as soon as at all possible, but I do think the reality is that it requires new government to be formed before it can be formally approved. But look... The reality is we have approval, in a sense, from the NTA. We have approval uh, for a multi-annual program already from the URDF. All we're seeking is the final approval of the total cost there. So that should happen in the next couple of months. Yeah, and this, and I, I raised it during the election campaign with Councillor Cummins and others of Fine Gael, that this commitment has been given and the guarantee has been given, but a commitment is only a commitment. It hasn't been written down in the sense it's signed off by the, the Cabinet, for example. So you're still waiting for the, the final approval. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, no, we're, we, we need that final approval. Um, we have approval and we have it in writing uh, for a multi-annual programme uh, with initial, an in, initial allocations there, but we need the final approval just to close out any uncertainty, if you know what I mean, around it. And like I say, we're working towards that and we'd be expecting it immediately or relatively immediately after the formation of government. That's, that's the simple reality of the position. 
OK, and the formation of government, we're looking potentially at the end of March, maybe even into April. And then obviously there's going to be a lot of issues to be discussed. So we could be looking at into May at least, Michael. Is that going to be good enough for the developers? Yeah, well, no, the situation is there. There's two things that we hope will happen contemporaneously. We're obviously in the planning process in the context of the the developer has submitted the planning application. There's further information uh, is being required on that because we have to treat it as uh, as we would any other planning application. And obviously, this the scale of this development is really, really significant, one of the biggest in the country as a whole. We see all that being concluded around the end of March as well. Uh, And the combination of those things will leave us collectively in a better place. Developers moving forward with that. We're moving forward on the basis of there's been no delay from our point of view in terms of progressing the planning, the design and all the other elements of the infrastructure. Uh, There's already been industry days in the context of that. We intend going to tender in April, for example, on those projects. So work is going on apace in the background, is the way I describe it. Can you just give me a final figure, Michael? How much has the council spent on all this so far? Do we know? Um, uh, low single finger millions. Probably no. Sorry, that's not true. Seven or eight million, which we have recruited the majority of that from the NTA and the URDF already. We'd have. Uh, okay. We'd have got about five or six million from the URDF for the last year's work, is the way I describe it, and equally for the monies over the last two years from the NTA. So there's a significant amount of money has been recouped. We've already spent and are spending at the moment another few low single millions, if you know what I mean, but we'd be expecting to reclaim that. And equally then there's land purchase, which we haven't concluded as yet, yeah. and that is happening at the moment, but... Uh, that is an asset, I suppose, that we're buying in many respects. And there's an awful lot of work on it. I know, I mean, there is, yeah. But need to be assured, uh, and we're driving on. Uh, we're determined to make it happen, is the way I put it. Michael Walsh, thanks very much for joining us this morning. No, but thank you, Damien. Thank you, Michael Walsh, City and County Manager there of Waterford Council. Let us know what you think. 083 333 975.